to History First, I'm Melissa and today we're going to be learning about what Stalin did once he was in power. In the last video, we saw how Stalin finally crawled his way into power, being very sneaky and being, you know, not a very polite politician, but he, he got there in the end, so his aims were right on. Now his aims are focused on making Russia the new Soviet America. This basically means he wants rapid industrialization so that Russia can be self-sufficient, as well as achieving more military strength. In addition, he wants to improve the agricultural produce, create a full socialist society, and improve living standards. So he's got a lot to do. Kicking off his rule, he decides to cancel the NEP, instead forcing peasants into collective farms. This forced collectivization transformed regular farms into communal farms, basically turning the whole village into one massive farm. Collective farms meant that land could be used more efficiently. The sharing of work was also a much more socialist concept, which was much more popular for the Bolsheviks in comparison to the NEP before. However, the peasants were quite resistant to the change of collectivization, as you would be if someone decided to take away all of your possessions, leaving you a very small plot of land, and instead make you eat and sleep and work with everyone else in the village. They protested by burning their crops instead of having the state take them away. This led to a huge drop in agricultural production. Despite this, the state collected 22.8 million tonnes of grain for the cities and for export. In addition, there was a drought over a very large area in 1931. This led to a famine killing millions in 1932-34, to 34, causing the famine to be man-made, as although there was sufficient grain, it was poorly organised, denying it to the poorest areas of Russia. So, that's famine. Good times. How do you make good times out of famine? That's the real question. You don't. Meanwhile, Stalin was initiating his five-year plans, although note that these rarely actually lasted five years. So, five-year plan number one, October 1928 to December 1932, lasting a solid five years of four years, so, you know, you tried. It emphasised mainly on heavy industries such as oil, coal and steel. It had some great successes, electricity production trebled and coal and iron production doubled. So, go Russia! In addition, huge new industrial complexes were being developed. However, the Great Depression had hugely lowered global prices, so the USSR didn't make as much as it needed. But the economy was kick-started, leading the way to future industrial developments. So, after the first five-year plan ending in December 1932, it led the way to the second five-year plan. This kicked off in January 1933 and went on to December 1937. Once again, a successful five-year plan lasting a good old four years, but you know, I don't even think they tried this time. I think they, they sort of gave up. They, they were so close as well. They were just getting, getting distracted. Come on, Russia, pull it together. This continued the scheme of new projects in industry and communications, which were really important because Russia is big. Just like space is big, Russia is big. And not quite as big as space, but you know, you can see where I'm coming from. It's hard to compare it because it is very big. By 1937, remember it ended in December 1937, Russia was virtually self-sufficient in machine making and metalworking. Also remember at this point, Russia is not Russia, it is the USSR. So don't say Russia when you mean the USSR because, you know, exam markers will judge you for it. Because they'll think you don't know your words when you do and you just say it wrong, but it was a good take so you leave it in anyway. So USSR, that's what you really mean. However, consumer goods were still lagging, but there was more disposable income, therefore less pressure on the economy. But after its four-year course and its end in December 1937, it led the way to the third five-year plan. Kicking off mere months after the end of the second five-year plan in January 1938 and going on until June 1941. But in Russia's defence, before you say three years is an even worse attempt than the previous five-year plans, a very important event started happening in June 1941. So. Russia was quite busy at that point, and if you don't know what it was, go Google it. During the third five-year plan, heavy industry kept growing, although steel output barely increased. In a negative addition, oil production failed, causing fuel crisis in the cities. Just to make matters even worse for the USSR, there was an exceptionally hard winter, and materials were being diverted for the war. So the five-year plans were a mixture of good and bad. Production generally increased, which meant there could be an investment into the economy, which helped Russia grow as a whole. But as a trend for the new USSR, the ordinary people were hit the hardest. Prices were often kept down to encourage people to loan money into the state banks to help the industry grow. Conditions were often extremely difficult in the cities and in rural areas. However, if you compare it to the core aims of the five-year plans, such as increasing industry and helping Russia become more self-sufficient, they were extremely successful. So, in questions like that, you often have to look at the different viewpoints. 
The people generally don't have much of a better life by these things, so it's unsuccessful from their standpoint. But as far as the politicians go, and Russia as a nation, they were very successful. So, now that we're done with five-year plans, you probably expect that we'll continue with this slight increase of positivity in the topics, but you would be wrong. Now we're going on to purges! Yay! If you watch Game of Thrones, imagine Joffrey as a historical period of time, and that will be as fun as the purges are. So, now I've slipped in my fandom references. The purges were basically class warfare in the early 30s to push the five-year plans forward. During the plans, any accused of sabotage or wreckers, basically anyone who made a mistake in the factories that ended up having some kind of economic or industrial cost, were sent to gulags. Gulags were the Russian prison camps where anyone could be sent, basically. During the purges, there were events known as show trials. Show trials were court cases that were basically there to prove that Stalin was right. High profile party members were accused of spying or being counter-revolutionary or plotting to overthrow Stalin. The show trials proved that Stalin was correct. He really was saving the people of Russia from a big threat because these people were found guilty. They would be brought in front of the court to confess their crimes and if they didn't want to confess, they would be very kindly convinced to confess with very conservative and gracious methods that I do not want to talk about. Those purged include Kamenev, Zinoviev and Bukharin, who you may remember from Stalin's rise to power. They must be feeling really pleased with themselves right now. This spread to become the terror, a nationwide purge. If you were accused, you could easily be taken to the Gulag by the NKVD, the Russian secret police. The NKVD would come in the middle of the night in black cars known as Ravens, sparking some <laughs> Seriously funny jokes, right? So, uh, it's two in the morning, pitch black, okay? Family, knocking at the door, huge banging. Husband goes downstairs to check, okay? The wife, upstairs, terrified. She thinks he's gonna be taken away to the gulag because he's political. So this is terrifying. She opens the door, she calls from upstairs. She says, who is it? And he says, it's just armed robbers. <laughs> ah, <laughs> ah, lol. You know, I think it's my technique, but I'm really not getting the humour in these jokes. Maybe, maybe it's, a, it's a Russian thing, I'm not sure. Moving on. In 1937, the army came under pressure. Civil war heroes were being purged. For example, Marshal to... It's on the screen, okay? I'm not even gonna try. Tukash Kaveshki? We're just gonna call him Marshal. That's fine. You're gonna, you know who I'm talking about by now. Marshall was a civil war hero, but he came into conflict with Stalin, therefore having a confession beaten out of him, so much so that his confession was bloodstained. But confessions were really important during this time because they showed that the state was right. It showed that you yourself were so dedicated to Soviet Russia that you would tell the world all the terrible things that you've done, even if you had to sign with your left arm because they've just broken your right during all the torture. <laughs> The purges were finally ended in 1938 due to their huge disruption of society. This is one of the rare occasions where Stalin was not to blame as the purges spiralled out of control. Although millions died during the purges, the effects were felt many years afterwards, especially as if one person was accused, all of those close to them would be suspected, as shown by the testimony of Stefan Ivanovich Semenov. After spending 15 years in the camp, he has no grandchildren or children. The worst thing is when you have no one waiting for you. No one needs you. In addition, one woman whose father was taken away spoke recently that I cry, and I am still crying. This was all under Stalin's rule, under Stalin's reign as the father of the great nation. So how is it that today, Russians will tell you that Stalin is a good man? He was a great leader. This is majoritively down to the cult of personality. Developed mainly between 1933 and 34, Stalin's image was everywhere. He was the sole unfaultable interpreter of party ideology. Lenin's heir himself. A genius with great wisdom, as shown in paintings and sculpture and art. If Stalin was around today and we were all in Russia, every day would be the Stalin apocalypse on Tumblr. What? Everything showed Stalin's humanity and compassion. He was monumental. As you could be easily persecuted for talking ill of Stalin, the stories of what really happened were very rarely passed on. So, that's the end of Stalin. He died March 1953, following which there was a lovely power struggle in which this fellow emerged, 
Khrushchev with a lovely abundance of H's in his name, so have fun spelling that. So, thank you very much for watching and I hope you enjoyed the videos. If you did, click subscribe and click like if you liked it. I mean, if you didn't like it, maybe just don't click dislike. Maybe just close the tab, that would be better for me, definitely. And you can follow me on Tumblr, which is also nice. And I will try and respond to things that you say. And I hope you have a lovely day. Dear TVA.